thank you everyone for joining us um, for this very, very topical discussion um, about the, the threat to British democracy. And in, in particular, the way that dark money cronyism has, um, well, I was gonna say, I was gonna say plagued the government, but perhaps it's more accurate to say that the government has actually embraced dark money and cronyism. Um, so um, we are, uh, just quickly introduce myself. My name is Martin Williams. I'm the acting UK investigations editor here at Open Democracy. And I'm very, very pleased to say that we're joined by the editor in chief of Open Democracy, Peter Gagan. And Peter is also uh, the author of this fantastic book, Democracy for Sale, <laughs> Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dirty Politics. Now, if you've not read the book, I would say it is, um, it's really just as relevant now as it was when it was first published. And I mean, Peter's investigations, particularly, um, you know, around the dark money that funded Brexit now seem to have a whole new life because of course, many of the very same people from the Brexit campaign are now in government, including, of course, Boris Johnson. Um, and I think, particularly right now, I mean, over the last few days, we've had, of course, the scandal around the Downing Street Christmas party. Um, and I think that's really shown that there is still very much a culture at the very top of British politics, which has a real disregard for transparency, the rule of law, democratic integrity, Etc. Um, now we've had some questions Peter sent in already, and you can also post questions into the comment section um, or just your general thoughts if you want to. Um, and we'll try and get through as we, you know we we don't have all the time in the world, but we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Um, so please feel free. Um, but. Before we get into the questions, I thought it might be interesting to start off by uh, kind of setting the scene a bit about the, the, the threat to democracy that, that we face in the UK. Uh, and there's a particular chapter in your book, Peter, where you talk about uh, an investigation you did into dark money that actually led you ultimately to joining Open Democracy in the first place. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's still quite a remarkable thing, I think. The, the very fact that I'm sitting here now, in some ways, is, is down to dark money. And not to dark money, not to dark money is funding open democracy. We are we, we declare all of our donors and many of our much of our funding actually comes from you, our readers. So thank you very much for that. But actually, my journey into dark money um, and my journey into, to open democracy actually started now over five and a half years ago, remarkably. It was June of 2016. And if you can cast your mind back, June of 2016 was when the Brexit referendum took place. And at the time I was working for the Irish Times. I was a reporter, um, I was freelance and I was, my news editor sent me to Sunderland to do one of those stories that you get before a big vote, like the Brexit referendum. Just, you go to somewhere, uh, you know, some were kind of seen as off the beaten track and report on how people are feeling, what are the voters thinking. So I went to Sunderland and I, you know, I discovered talked a lot of people who were, going to, who were voting for Brexit as subsequently happened. It was about 48 hours before the referendum. But when I was leaving Sunderland, I was at the train station, at the metro station, and there was a, a copy of the Metro, the free newspaper, the Metro. And I noticed on the front page was a big, huge uh, slogan saying, take back control. You know, and as a lot of you might remember, that was take back control was Dominic Cummings and the, the Leave campaign slogan. But I noticed that I turned around, it was a big wraparound advert that took up the whole of the front page of the newspaper, the whole of the newspaper, four pages. Uh, and I noticed on the back it had a little logo that said, paid for on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party. It had a little the DUP line's head logo. And I thought that's very curious. I'd worked as a reporter in Northern Ireland before as well. And I was wondering, why are the Democratic Unionist Party, a political party, you know, hundreds of miles away in Belfast, why are they spending money on expensive adverts in Sunderland? And, you know, I kind of took a snapshot of it and sent a tweet and kind of filed it away in my memory because one of the things I was really interested in and I was thinking about was I knew that political donations in Northern Ireland were kept secret under a loophole from, uh, from the Troubles, you know, from the conflict in Northern Ireland. So I thought, I wonder, are people trying to funnel money through the DUP to get around spending limits? Anyway, I kind of forgot about it, as you do as a reporter. I got on the train, started filing my copy for the next day's paper. Then a few months later, I got a phone call from Adam Ramsey at Open Democracy. And Adam was saying, you know, you are, I hear you're interested in the DUP and their Brexit referendum spending. He said, I'm interested as well. And Adam had noticed that in Edinburgh, around the same time I was in Sunderland, there was all these posters and placards that had the same little imprint. 
paid for by the Democratic Unionist Party. The two of us said, well, this is, this is interesting. Let's see what we can do. So we started investigating and we found Facebook ads paid for by the DUP. We found lots of receipts and expenses for merchandise, all bought, not in Northern Ireland, for the DUP normally buys all of its election uh, material, but bought, bought, bought in Cambridgeshire in England, again, many hundreds of miles away. And the DUP had spent almost nothing, it turns out, in Northern Ireland during the Brexit referendum, but had spent a fortune in England, Scotland, and Wales. And what we were able to discover, actually, was that the DUP had spent almost half a million pounds during its Brexit referendum campaign. And that money came from an organization called the Constitutional Research Council, which sounds really grand. Constitutional Research Council sounds like, you know, they could have a fancy office in the middle of London doing great research. Actually, the Constitutional Research Council is effectively a legal fiction. It's, a, it's an unincorporated association, which means it doesn't have to file any accounts, doesn't have to say where its money comes from. But we discovered it was based out of a terraced house, a pebble dash terraced house on the outskirts of Glasgow, where I was living at the time. And it was run by a man called Richard Cook, who was a serial failed Conservative Party candidate, uh, who would also, as we were able to uncover, been involved in some seriously shady international deals, including setting up a company with an arms trader from Denmark and a former head of Saudi secret intelligence. And lo and behold, it turns out that the DUP, this money, as we had suspected, had been effectively routed through Northern Ireland. We didn't know where it came from. We didn't know how it was, how, who was behind it, but we only were able to tell that it had come from this organization called the Constitutional Research Council. And to put it into context, 500,000 pounds is the biggest ever political donation in Northern Ireland. And the context of the referendum was a huge amount of money. It was more, far more money than was spent in the whole of Northern Ireland. And so it was a huge it during the referendum. And so what we were, you know, that was kind of almost in some ways my introduction to dark money. It was like, wow, it's possible to do this. It's, and at the end of the day, the Constitutional Research Council were fined £6,000 by only one one hundredth of the amount that they'd spent for breaking electoral law. We don't even know how they broke electoral law because of, uh, because of the secrecy surrounding Northern Irish political donations. But two things happened after that. One was I started looking into dark money in politics in a big way. And the second thing was that actually the law in Northern Ireland was changed on the back of open democracy's work. And now political donations in Northern Ireland are no longer kept secret, but many of the same loopholes that exist across the United Kingdom to funnel dark money into politics exist. It's um, it's quite remarkable, really, to have that story, the kind of arc of that story. Um, uh, and of course, you know, we still don't know the, the true source of that DUP money, do we? No, this is, I, you know, I often joke on, on, on calls like this, like, if you know where the DUP's money came from, do, do let me know. But quite remarkably, I started off with one question, who gave the DUP all this money? And I ended up with a book, um, I ended up with a job, I ended up with, in many ways, uh, you know, an entire kind of stream of, of, of stories about money and politics, you know, and, and frankly, I think for people like me and Martin, and Martin has also written a book on Parliament, Parliament Inc. a few years ago as well, for people like me and Martin who've been writing about these issues for so long, you know, in some ways to see the corruption of British politics that like front and centre in the news agenda now is, you know, it's, it's very heartening to see, but there is so many, many of these stories and there's so much that needs to be done on it. So in many ways, it started me asking questions. And I was kind of amazed. I don't know if you were too, Martin, when you started writing your book, that I started writing about, you know, think tanks who are funded by anonymous donors. I started writing about like how easy it is to buy fake grassroots political campaigns on the internet. And I was just amazed actually how many of these stories weren't been written. I was, you know, genuinely shocked. I, I, I wouldn't have thought that this whole terrain, in many ways, you know, from this one story about the DUP, and I think just being inquisitive and asking questions, this is where it all flowed from. And I, I couldn't have imagined that it would have been, uh, yeah, as I said, like an almost empty territory. Yeah. The first question I wanted to to put to you, Peter, was it, um, it, it about the parallels between kind of what we saw with Brexit and what we're we're seeing now. How are MPs in the thrall of the dark money lobbyists of Tufton Street different from those exposed following the Patterson scandal? So, I mean, I think really interesting to kind of get your, your take on what, what has changed. Is this the same? Is this just the same continuation of the same thing? I think it's useful actually to be to kind of separate out some of the things, some of these different things are what we're talking about. So like dark money is anonymous funding that goes into the political process from any kind of source. So it's money you can't see. So one good, one conduit, one regular way of put, putting money, dark money into political 
system is through these kind of things called unincorporated associations, like the way the DUP's money went into the Brexit referendum. So that's anonymous. You can't see, you can't see how it gets into the political system. Similarly, uh, with these anonymously funded think tanks, they're able to influence the policy agenda, they're able to meet government ministers, they're able to lobby, they're able to write voluminous amounts of media uh, column inches, and we don't know where the money comes from. Owen Patterson, the Owen Patterson affair is, is, is really just straight up lobbying. You know, it was registered as lobbying and he broke the rules multiple times and it was on behalf of a company. And in many ways, it's a similar process, though. It's a similar, like the problem is the same problem at root. It's the way in which access is bought, sold in politics. So what you saw with Owen Patterson is his, you know, his engagement Randox was was on the was on the political register. He registered it. You know, it was there for all to see. And in many ways, it only became a scandal when uh, it became a scandal partly because he was found to have broken the rules so many times but actually it only it's worth remembering the real reason old patterson became such a scandal was the conservative party under boris johnson attempted to get rid of the entire standards commission process and replace it with a bunch of tory mps led by john wishing who himself had been done multiple times by the standards process and had they not done that had they not such huge hubris you know i think that old patterson would still be an mp but behind that own Patterson story, like the David Cameron and Greensill story, is an equally concerning thing. It's just as concerning as dark money, which is all about how lobbyists, how politicians are able to act as lobbyists. And if that's happening, who are they representing? You know, if a politician has been paid to act as a lobbyist, and actually also if a former politician is being paid to act as a lobbyist and using his connections, you know, who are they representing? Are they representing you and me in the public? Or are they representing the people that they're lobbying for? Like in the instance of Owen Patterson, as, as myself and Martin Williams were able to reveal on Open Democracy, Owen Patterson was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Then he was the, uh, the in the Department for um, the Agriculture Department, DEFRA. As soon as he left office, within weeks of left, leaving office, he started ringing around companies that he met while in government, while as a minister, to ask, can he do some consulting for it? And that's where the Randocks deal came from. Randox, these, uh, these, these people, this uh, pharma kind of testing company based in Northern Ireland, they were paying Owen Patterson £100,000 a year. What were they getting for their £100,000 a year? Well, we now know that when these COVID contracts are to be given out, Randox were given almost half a billion pounds in COVID contracts and then Owen Patterson lobbied on their behalf. That's a huge return on your £500,000. And I think it's just as concerning as the kind of dark money that we're talking about in the political process. And it's the same, it's, it's again taking advantage of how loose and how lax our laws and regulations are uh, on, 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 on politics and on funding of politics. And I would just add to that, that um, as we wrote about an open democracy the other day, that there's, after the Owen Patterson scandal the other day, there, there, there have been suggestions for new, uh, a new ban on um, political consultants. But actually, that wouldn't have stopped Owen Patterson from taking his job in the first place. And so there's got to be a kind of more, a deeper kind of problem with the, not only the rules, but also the, the culture. Um, and I think uh, I, I would say at this point that, that there are a lot of people, the most, the most asked question for you, Peter, is, is about what can be done. Um, a lot of people have asked this. And I, I think we'll say that to the end once we've covered a lot of uh, other ground first, but we will come to that. Um, but, but before that, I just wanted to ask when MPs take the oath of serving an MP, serving as an MP, what are the consequences when they break that oath? Are there no penalties? And I suppose the, the Owen Patterson scandal really, really speaks to that. Yeah, I think this is the, this is a huge. If you look at what the penalties are, like Owen, as I mentioned earlier, it was hubris really that led to Owen Patterson having to resign. You know, if he he was going to be suspended for just thirty days from the House of Parliament, and that was going to be the sum total of his punishment. If you are a former minister who breaks the rules about uh, taking up ministerial work after you've left office, um, the what are called ACABA, the a, a mouthful of a name of the uh, basically appointments commission on. Uh, Business Comm Commission on Business Appointments. Can't remember. Advisory Commission. Advisory. Actually, the first word is important. Advisory. So if you break their rules, all they will do is ask you to apologise. That is it. You, they, and that is the sum total of, of what they will do to you. 
There is almost no sanction for breaking these rules. And that, at the end of the day, is a huge problem. It's the same with, with political, with fines. The maximum fine in British politics for breaking a British electoral law is £20,000. Yeah, it's a tiny amount of money. It's the cost of doing business. And we know that it's the cost of doing business. If you look at the Brexit referendum, the spending limits that were broken by the Leave campaign were £7 million. They broke that limit by about £500,000. They were fined just £20,000 for doing this. If you know that that's what the penalty is going to be, you can always just ask someone to cover it for you. It's a tiny amount of money for these huge political campaigns. And that at the root of it, like if we were serious about it, if we were serious about regulation, if we were serious about things like the oath of office, we would have actual strictures and fines for people who broke broke the law but we don't and that shows just how little um you know how little emphasis is really placed on this is the only answer to ban all new jobs for mps while they are mps that really has been very much the question on on a lot of people's lips over the last few weeks do you have a take on that i think it, i think the idea that um mps are able to take jobs as lobbyists and things like that while they're in office is frankly ridiculous. Um, but it's quite striking. The government's backslided massively on this, having initially said, we're going to ban second jobs. It's it's a very particular reading of second jobs. There's not very many of the second jobs that currently exist of governments that will be stopped by this. So and I think so there's one aspect there. But I also think by just focusing on second jobs, we risk missing lots of other things, especially that thing I mentioned a little bit before about the Advisory Commission on Business Appointments. What that means, what this is all about, is the revolving door between the cabinet and, and business and big business. So, you know, if you take Sajib Javid was the treasurer and he left the treasury uh, number 11 in a, you know, kind of early 2020, he walked straight out the door. Within six months, he was on about £125,000 a year for JP Morgan as an advisor for almost no work. You know, that's a huge, huge, huge problem. This is, uh, you know, and it's, if you think about it, why this matters so much is if you're a politician, you're in office and you go, okay, my political career is short, political careers are short. I have, but I've got, if I, if, if I keep my nose, if I, you know, if I told a line, there's every chance I'll be given a, a, a non-executive directorship for hundreds of thousands of pounds by a big company on the other side of this. And there's almost nothing to stop that happening. Within a couple of years, I can walk straight into this. That's exactly what happened to David Cameron in Greensill. He was getting millions and millions of pounds from Greensill to effectively sell his access. And he was able to do that because the law, the, the rules are so poor. The great irony, of course, being that David Cameron was the one who said that lobbying was a great next scandal waiting to happen. And in many ways, he was the one people who made it happen. But it, there's so much to this. I think it's 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 that the way in which it's second jobs are part of it, but it's the fundamental way in which politicians are able to sell their access to power to the highest bidder, both inside of office and outside of office. I think it's so politically corrupting. I mean, so on, on second jobs specifically, um, because this has caused a lot of debate and um, what, what defenders of second jobs will always say is that it's very difficult to ban second jobs outright because then what, what if an MP, for instance, wants to write a book or if they want to, you know, write a column for a newspaper or, you know, do um, weekend shifts at a charity? Should they be banned from from doing that? Now, what I've always argued is that they, they should they can do what they want, but they should only have one paymaster. But it, is it actually? Do you think it's actually more complicated than that? I think there's a risk that we get we get we get kind of into the weeds on something that like isn't that significant in some respects. I think it's not hard to find some way in which you say, look, there's, you know, if, if someone writes a book, you can't stop them getting royalties. Is there a problem with people writing books? I don't think generally there is, you know. I think the fact that the Prime Minister seems to have been obsessed with writing his own delayed book on Shakespeare when COVID happened, that's a problem. A backbench MP writing a book, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I think having people who are engaged and engaged in, in you know, in, in that world of politics, is, is fine. I think fundamentally, I think there's a, there's a big, the big question is, is there a corporate, is there business and corporate interest behind something? That's where I think the real root of the problem lies. You know, and in some ways, like the people who want to continue that being paid 50, 60,000 pounds. So for example, David Davis was paid, I think, 60,000 pounds by JCB 
for about 20 hours work after he left to been the Brexit Secretary. JCB is run for the Bamfords, big Tory donors. You know, he's on £3,000 an hour. That's some consultancy rate. Like, and that's for a private interest. I think, you know, I think that fundamentally, I think when we get too lost into the minutiae of like if someone's a nurse or something, we missed what the real issue here is. It's not so much MPs making other bits of money, it's who's behind them. Who's, where is, you know, where is, is there another potential paymaster? As you say, a paymaster, right? So that's yeah. the thing. If if someone's writing a book with their name on it and they get a royalty check, I don't see the other paymaster. If someone's working for the NHS as a nurse, again, I don't see the other paymaster. If someone is, you know, on the board of a company that they're, as we've revealed so many times in Open Democracy, where people are, say, work, are paid by a company and then they're also facilitating meetings between that company and government ministers. That's happening all the time. The lobbying legislation that David Cameron created is so weak and so poor. We'd actually be better off with no legislation because at least then we would be able to say there's no legislation, we need to do something. Yeah. Um, now, there's a question here, which I mean, you talked about then uh, before you talked about ACOBA, uh, the advisory committee on, on business appointments. Um, and we've both, Peter, both you and I have talked a lot, to, had a lot of conversations about how rubbish a lot of the kind of regulators and watchdogs are that are meant to keep British politics clean. There's a question in the comments. Um, how were the penalties arrived at? Um, I, I'm not sure exactly which penalty is being referred to, but basically, are politicians who might be punished by these penalties deciding what they are themselves? And if so, uh, she says, then it's not surprising that consequences are inconsequential. Yeah, well, completely. This is a huge part of the problem with this, you know, is that like, you know, it is who guards the guardians. And, you know, it, we, there's reasons for us to be really concerned, frankly, because like you know, here at Open Democracy, I'm telling you, you know, that the laws don't work; they're too weak. They're only going to get at the moment. At things at, it, on the current trajectory, they're actually getting worse, not better. So, the Electoral Commission, which is supposed to be the regulator of our political uh, process um, in, here in Britain, you know, I've written numerous times about how I would like to see the Electoral Commission be stronger. The weakness of it. My book talks about it at length. You know, the way in which there's so much of a need for a stronger electoral commission, we need stronger rules. The government's elections bill, which is going through the comp going through the House of Parliament at the moment, means the opposite. They want to increase the political oversight of the executive over the electoral commission. The electoral commission will essentially be overseen by the executive branch of government. What that means is the government of the day effectively is in charge of the electoral commission. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out what happens when you put, you know, to mix a few metaphors when they put the fox in charge of the chicken coop. You know, there's a huge problem with this. And our, the, the fines that are already weak enough, the laws are already weak enough, are, I, I fear are going to get even worse. The elections bill, I think, is a scandal. We've been writing about it here at Open Democracy a lot. We've featured experts, people like former electoral commissioner David Howard writing about it. We've written numerous stories about it. And it's, it's something I think everyone needs to be up in arms in about this country. We need to see and understand just how dangerous and pernicious this is. Because, you know, as, as, a, as that questionnaire asks us, as, as Marion asks, like, you know, not only are these rules that we currently have not fit for purpose and been set in many respects by politicians, the future could be even worse for that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, when we started, you, you know, you, you were talking about um, the DUP money and, you know, you mentioned that actually the laws partly, well, entirely as a result of the investigation, the laws were actually changed in Northern Ireland to um, basically stop people hiding their, stop uh, wealthy donors from hiding their political donations. Um, now, that obviously is a big step forward, but I wonder, you know, since you wrote the book, whether you think that there has been, you know, whether we've seen improvement generally, whether things have got worse, whether the problems are just changing around, um, you know, what, what's your sense of that? I think it's in many ways. I think actually it's, it's got worse since I wrote the book. I, I you know it's depressing, but it's you know in some ways I could write. I could have written a second book just on this year. 
you know, some of the things, you know, between the first edition of this book coming out and the paperback edition, you know, we here at Open Democracy did a lot of work on COVID cronyism, you know, which in many ways was just the epitome of this, you know, and it was so writ large, like we were in probably one of the first outlets to really start writing about this and digging into these COVID contracts and showing how politically connected people were getting huge amounts of government money through, you know, and frankly, through their connections into the political system. And in some ways, you know, when that happened, when those first stories started coming my way, I, you know, in the, I first kind of got onto that when I started thinking about like, well, what's happening here? Why, you know, why are the go, you know, why in April of 20, 2020, it was kind of late April 2020, I started talking to contacts on the procurement side of things who were raising red flags to me, raising red flags about the connections between companies who were being brought into work uh, and, and, and the government, frankly, you know. I, first story, one of the first stories I wrote was about Deloitte. The, who we outsourced, we effectively outsourced our pandemic response to Deloitte in the cabinet office. And Deloitte incredibly politically connected. Chloe Smith, the cabinet office ministry, used to work for Deloitte. Deloitte had huge amounts of government contracts and huge amounts of political connections. And in some ways, you know, I, I thought the scenario was bad enough when I wrote the book in the first time, but actually, you know, I feel like the last 18 months has, has shown just how deep this problem is. You know, but as I mentioned earlier, like, it's kind of remarkable for people like me and Martin to see front page of the Daily Mail about, like, you know, MP second jobs, because these are the stories we've been trying to take forward and trying to write about for so long and writing about putting into public domain. And, and often, you know, feeling like it hasn't been picked up enough by, you know, the rest of the media. So I think it's it's super important that it is now and it continues to be because otherwise, um, you know, otherwise, like, the only chance we have of changing this system is by all working together and putting this stuff in the public domain. Otherwise, just things will not change. Sorry, I muted myself there accidentally. Um, yeah, um, now th there's uh, a couple of questions uh, in the comments um, about um, the, well, about the regulation, but also about, uh, there's a question here about money laundering um and from from non-uk nationals and I, I you know because part of this is about cleaning up british politics but also part of it is about stopping foreign interference in british democracy and i i you know i wonder like how much you think that these failings are not just uh you know uh to the benefit of government and politicians here in the uk but also to the benefit of corrupt powers abroad Oh, massively so. I think this is this is this is a huge, huge part of this problem. There's a huge. Like, this is this. Uh, you know, we there's just a new report out by Transparency International today, which we've just been writing about in Open Democracy, which is about you know how basically oligarchs and kleptocrats, including a conservative donor, are able to you know use Britain's like you know Britain's central role as a facilitating node for corruption to buy British property to wash their, you know, there's a whole kind of, you know, it's almost like a triangular trade uh, that Britain is at the center of corruption. You know, you wash your, you wash your dirty money in the city of London, you get your blue chip reputation management firms in Mayfair to, to, to launder your reputation on the internet. You're able to buy access to British politicians to make sure elect changes don't happen that are going to impact you. There's a huge, you know, and I think we underestimate just how important Britain's role is as a global corruption center. And the city of London and, and, and kind of money laundering and also reputation laundering sit at the center of this. And, you know, the relationship, you know, and we know from our reporting that of others that we've seen a lot of Russian oligarchs giving money to the Conservative Party. And we know that this money buys access. We now have, you know, we have a, is it, is Evgeny Lebedev's baron of Siberia in the House of Lords, you know? And we, as our investigation recently at Open Democracy with the Sunday Times showed that three million pounds for, for your Tory treasurer effectively buys you a seat in the House of Lords. You know, that's, what, what do we think, what, what else could we call that except for corruption? If that happened in another country, and frankly, you know, it's, it's cheap at hand, it would be cheap at twice the price. You know, so there's, there's a huge problem in terms of this nexus, and we shouldn't really be surprised if we invite dirty money into our country. We shouldn't be surprised that corruption starts to spread way beyond that. Now, we've got various questions, as I said before, on kind of what we actually do to fix the, the system. Um, some general, some specific questions. So I'm just going to turn to the first one of those. Um, is naming and shaming corporations who are buying government influence and access, is that an effective deterrence against corruption? 
I think there's, I, I, naming and shaming is important. It's important, but I, I feel like this is the main vehicle that the British government does have for things. And I think there's a wider question here about regulation. Like, you know, if we are, if, if regulation is supposed to be the thing, and this is, you know, this is how liberal democracies deal with these issues. We regulate and we say, look, we're going to regulate something. But then that regulation has to have some sort of teeth that has to work. So for example, there's a story I do every three or four years where I send an FOI uh, to uh, the CPS and, and, the, and the, uh, the Ministry of Justice to find out how many people have been prosecuted for failure to pay the minimum wage. Because every year, loads of people don't pay the minimum wage. And every year, every time I do it, I get the same result, which is basically nobody. And the reason they do that is because they look, we name and shame people. We, we name and shame so they don't do it. Well, it doesn't really work, does it then? If people, if you're continuing to name and shame more and more people every year, it would suggest that just putting someone's name on a website isn't sufficient to determine. So I think that is, you know, if that's your main stick, naming and shaming something, I think there's a problem. I think we need to have, like, you know, we... We talk really great. We talk a great game about anti-corruption in the United Kingdom. There's lots of great stuff going through Parliament. There's actually great legislation that we just haven't enforced around companies' house. But fundamentally, to make that work, you have to have teeth. You have to have a police force, a proper anti-corruption unit, the police force. You know, look at like take for example what the, I'm harking back to it again. The story we did with the Sunday Times about Tory donors in France. Nicolas Sarkozy was you know they they. Our police went into, you know, went straight into his house, raided his house over corruption allegations. Here, the Met Police took three, three or four days to then say, "We're well, there's not enough evidence to to uh, prosecute or to even to even have an investigation, a prosecutor, even have an investigation." And so, I think that speaks to a very different perspective, and it begs a lot of questions about the separation of powers between policing and government. But fundamentally, naming and shaming, I think, will not be enough. We need to have teeth. We need to have something that people are scared of. Otherwise, they will continue to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's actually, it's actually um, twice in the last two months that the police have refused to investigate government. We had it over the allegations around cash for peerages, um, mm -hmm. where the Met Police um, complaints were issued by, uh, by MPs to the Met Police and they didn't do anything. And then um, again, just you know, yesterday today, there were complaints about this party in in Downing Street, and again, the Met Police haven't even launched an investigation, let alone come to a, a, a conclusion about it. So there's definitely there's definitely a, a kind of question there, isn't there? Um, can we use technology to tag money so that it uh, so that its passage through politics becomes more visible? I don't know whether the answer necessarily is technology, but but kind of what what can be done to kind of tag money in that way? I think like, what's interesting is we actually do have quite good the electoral commission. You have to publish data on the electoral commission's website. It's pretty good. It's you know it's the kind of thing that most people don't know exists. The likes of myself and Martin use it all the time. Um, but it's often it's it's a pretty good resource. I think the big challenge is there's a couple of big issues with it. One is the thresholds for disclosure are too high. And the second one is it's really easy to get around it. You know, it's really easy to use things like unincorporated associations to give an honesty to political parties. And we know this has been warned of. The Commission on, Public, Commission on Standards of Public Life had a report on this earlier in the summer just talking about this, talking about the problem of this. But fundamentally, you know, like what you need is, is, is a government is willing to, to, to change, is to, willing to do something about it to make it more transparent. Because the, the mechanisms exist to do this. It's not rocket science, but it begs the question, why don't you want to do it? What's the reason why you don't want to do it? Why do you want to create a system in which it's easy to hide where political money comes from? And I think that has to be asked time and again. What's the, like, you know, I saw one of somebody asked uh, Quay Bono, who benefits in the chat? That is the question we have to ask over and over about this. Um, should the House of Lords be abolished and would that help stop corruption? I mean, it's a kind of two questions there, I suppose. <laughs> yeah it's a good question I do think um, um, I do think like I think the House of Lords as currently instituted speaks to a, a democratic crisis in British politics you know there's a fantastic feature in the FT weekend section a couple of weeks ago about you know I think I remember one, one of these ridiculous by-elections where three people are voting for a house seat in the House of Lords. And it was about the hereditary peers, but more generally the whole issue of the House of Lords. And I think, you know, while you have, and I find a lot of the arguments about the House of Lords are kind of red herrings, 
there are arguments about why you might want a second chamber. And I think that's actually a very valid argument, but a very different argument to having the House of Lords as it currently is. You know, lots of countries have second chambers. It can be very effective. It can be useful places. But that is not the same as for why you'd want to have the House of Lords as currently constituted. But if you think about it, if you have a space in the middle of your politics where political donors and political friends are able to be rewarded with seats in a legislature, don't forget this, we should never forget this. It's a legislature. It is a body where, which makes laws, which is involved in the making of laws. And you can get a seat for life in a legislature um, as a political donor. And I think that's incredibly important. Like really, really, really important. It's really important we don't forget that. Um, and I think as long as you have that space, you we're going to have problems. You know, we will continue to, you know, I think it it's almost like a shining beacon of some of the wider problems that we have here. Okay, so here's the million dollar question. Um, what what can we do? What what is the answer? How do we how do we clean up the system? How do we stop dark money? Um and specifically not just you know us as a country but as individuals as well what what can ordinary people do it's a very very good question and it's a really interesting um i can see some really interesting kind of comments uh in uh in like uh in the chat there about you know like kind of my own am i as optimistic as i was like is that you know is uh has my mind been changed by what's happened recently? And I th you know, there's, there is, there's, I think there's two things. One is a kind of, is some of the technocratic solutions. And by that, I mean things like proper fines for breaking electoral law, proper systems, proper processes, having a situation in which if you are found to have broken the rules, you are actually punished rather than a kind of weak slap on the wrist. You know, I think there's a huge, there's a big issue with that that has to be tackled. And there's technocratic solutions there which would really help. We could take so much dark money out of our politics. You know, we could stop inviting anonymously funded think tanks onto, uh, onto um, the BBC and places like that. You know, like that's, you know, that's, that's really, like there's lots of things we could do to, to deal with that. I think we should do them. We should be doing them as a matter of expediency. They should be like something that we're all want to do quickly. I think the other thing is like, there's a bigger question as well. And we haven't talked about, I think, the role of tech as well. And it's like tech platforms and the, the way in which tech platforms um, can be used to, um, uh, you know, to, to spread kind of disinformation to political systems intentionally. That's really important too. But there's a wider point here as well, which is like, how do we refresh our democracy itself? How do we help people to engage in democracy differently? You know, I can say, you know, here at Open Democracy, we, we care about this. It's one of the reasons we try, we, we don't just tell, we don't just reveal things. We also, you know, we invite you, our readers, to, to fund our work, but also to be engaged in our work, to send letters to your MPs, to fill out our surveys, to fill out our polls, to, you know, to, to lobby for change from that perspective too. And I think, you know, there is a real need for grassroots energy, grassroots activism, grassroots work to re-energize our democracy. You know, to, to kind of to, to build back some of that trust in it. And I think there's a need for politicians who actually can walk the walk that they talk about, as well as talk to talk about these issues. Because what we find time and again, you know, say it's something like freedom of information, an issue that we really care about. Like a, a political party is all for freedom of information until they get into office and then it goes off the you know, then they've no interest. They want to they go back to the status quo. And that's that's the huge thing. Like one of the reasons we don't see change in this is because actually it's in almost every party's interest not to change it because they all think they know how to how to run this rigged system. And in some ways, the British politics is in the worst place for it because you know it's a cliche, but a British general election is like six hundred and fifty mini general elections. Every MP knows how to win their local general election, so there there isn't an impetus then to change the system. And I think. As long as there is no impetus to change the system, there won't be change. And some of that impetus has to come from people. It has to come from action. And I mean, you, you touched on technology there as well. And in your book, you talk a lot about Cambridge Analytica, of course. Um, how optimistic then are you that um, the, 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 we, that technology will um, uh, enable a, a de democratic um, decisions and democratic debate because you know so often we see uh, reports of you know whether it's Cambridge Analytica or um, you know the, the 
fake news uh, on, on social media. And, you know, it, it feels like technology um, is, is kind of in, in a place that, that it can really dominate. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's like, uh, I think it is it is a kind of, you know, it's so fascinating. I, I remember going to Egypt to cover the Arab Spring back in 2010. And it was, you know, I remember in Tahrir Square when all this was kicking off. And it was quite remarkable. It was a remarkable place to be. And it was called the Twitter Re Revolution. And there was a whole kind of conversation around that, how technology was going to empower a new surge of democracy. And what we have seen clearly is the opposite. And again, what you've got there is that, you know, a profit motive of large companies that is not inherently democratic, actually quite the opposite. And, you know, is able to make money from like actually really feeding this kind of distrust in politics and in politicians. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of thing that I'm always really conscious of in the work that we're doing too, is just like, as well as flagging up what's going wrong and flagging up politicians breaking the rules, you know, providing spaces to talk about what alternative ways of, of doing this might look like, how we could do this better, because you can do this better. And I think, you know, technology provides opportunities, but at the moment, and in the way tech companies are currently able to be used to spread political disinformation, there's a huge, you know, there's a huge vacuum there and a huge concern. Um, now, we're going to wrap up quite soon, but before we do, I just want to um, let everyone know that um, we have a live discussion next week uh, called Killing the Truth, um, and it's looking at what we can do to stop uh, journalists around the world from from being murdered, which is something that we see um, sadly far, far, far too often. Um, uh, that uh, I think uh, a link will be put in the chat there. And also, if you want to support Open Democracy, you can do so um, via our website. Um, we are, you know, uh, we we kind of do rely very much on, on uh, reader donations. So um, anything that you can 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 give us is, is, is really very much appreciated. And it really does go towards helping us do this kind of um, really important journalism. So um, thank you to you know, anyone who, 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 who's able to, to help that with that. Um, now, finally, Peter, just on, you know, you, you touched on your um, kind of levels of optimism and that there have been a couple of questions about that and I just so I just wonder like you know, overall going forward you know we've got all these I mean people were talking on Twitter about you know maybe this is it for Boris Johnson now with this you know Christmas party and you know lying and um, I mean, in fact there was there were calls for him to resign today in the Commons. Um, do you think that you know, do do we ever learn from uh, on political corruption? You know, and um, you know, dark money. Do do we ever make any progress on this? Are you optimistic for twenty twenty two, or are you feeling gloomy? I think I am still optimistic. I'm, I, I part of me is optimistic that these this conversation, these stories have now become front and center. You know, like this time last year, these were you know, in some ways, issues that people like me and you, Martin, wrote about were across, but a lot of general public wasn't across them. And I feel like if we've achieved nothing else. Open democracy has put these issues up front and centre political agenda. I think that can only be a good thing because they are real. They exist. They've existed. They exist, frankly, whether they're on the front page of the Daily Mail or not. But by putting them in those places, by putting these on the news agenda, I think we certainly are hoping a better place where change might be possible on the back of it. And you know, we we basically have a, a sleaze by election coming up in North Shropshire quite soon. So you know, let's see what happens there too. So I. I, I I'm very cautiously optimistic, and in many ways, my nature is, is optimism. So maybe that's that, that is my tendency towards that. Yeah, I think I uh, I think I agree with you on, on that one. Cautious optimism. Um, it will be uh, it's an ongoing battle. <laughs> but look, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you to everyone um, for watching, for your questions, um, and um, we will inevitably have a lot more uh, open democracy investigations on dark money and corruption and cronyism so do um keep up with today with uh, follow us on twitter and and all the rest of it uh, but yeah great thank you so much peter and everyone and uh hope you have a good evening thank you everybody have a lovely evening guys